So we used the time to set up the stage the way he needed it. Just a few more words about Silvio Michali and then we start. He's Italian originally from Palermo and got a mathematics degree, I'd like to stress, from Rome before moving on to computer science, getting his PhD in Berkeley. He's the happy recipient of a Goethe Prize in 1993 and the Turing Award in 2012, jointly with Shafi Goldwasser. He is one of the inventors of zero-knowledge proofs, one concept that's always fascinated me quite a bit, and has worked on public key crypto systems, pseudo-random functions, digital systems, signatures, and many more. Today, as we already heard, he will speak about Algorand, the truly distributed ledger. The stage is yours. Thank you, Derek. Thank you all, uh, and good morning, everyone. It's a great pleasure to come back uh, to Heidelberg. So I'd like to tell you about Algorand and try to convince you that you know, it is a blockchain. But you know what? It's not like the type we have, you are familiar with. It's quite alternative. And, and uh, in fact, has been uh, developed from scratch because sometimes uh, rather than patching whatever exists, you are better off erasing it and uh, start from, uh, um, um, from the very beginning. And in some sense, I'd like to convince you, which is, should not be clear right now, that somehow enables uh, continuous progress. In any case, let me tell you a little bit about blockchains, right? And uh, a blockchain, and I really mean a permissionless blockchain, that's, uh, the, uh, whatever excites me the most, is a sequence. <laughs> All right, good morning. <laughs> Algorand, and you know, is an alternative, developed from first principles, and whatever that means for now, enabling continuous progress. So, speaking of progress, we should get going, uh, is uh, 12, 11, 26. All right. What is a blockchain? It's a sequence of data organized in blocks. Here they are, data block one, data block two, etc. And um, the import, satisfying three main properties. The first one, it should be readable by all. How do we signify that by a picture? We put them in the sky. So everybody is welcome to look up and see, and see the blocks. Second of all, it's writable by all, by all. Now we are in the sky, it's a bit more complicated. But, you know, that person who wants to put an entry, it will appear in the next block or a few blocks for later. That is good. And um, the third property is uh, tamper-proof for all. What does it mean? That uh, you cannot change the content of the blocks and you cannot change the order of the blocks. Think of these blocks like bulletproof glass and chain them all together, all in the sky. The metaphor gets a little bit weaker and weaker as we go, but uh, you can see, right? All right. So, by the way, readable by all, writable by all, tamper-proof by all, let me make one thing clear. These objects do not yet exist. Blockchains are aspirational. They are written all over the place, the decentralized database, the engine of the world, you know. We have to get there, okay? So, and blockchains are all about technology. And I believe that that's why it's important in a forum like this to put them in, and, and, and thank you the, and, uh, the organizers for dedicating uh, this uh, topic to this project because we recruit the best minds and new young people to work on this object because humanity may need it and we don't actually have the technology to implement them but otherwise they are very cool stuff. All right, so what are good for? Well, decentralized storage, but you know, those critics, always among us, they're going to say, hey, I've been seeing the databases for a long time. Databases are very fast. These guys are kind of dinosaurs on a, on a bicycle when everybody comp uh, competes with Maseratis and the like. True, but they also are transparent. You know, transparency in uh, regular databases, they don't match, but how much do I want to spend for transparency? Then uh, some other applications are actually cryptocurrency, and there I say, you know, we start getting into gear, into something that, you know, the regular world uh, doesn't quite have, and, um, and maybe that is worthwhile doing. But finally, I really think that we start getting into the usefulness of these objects when we look at the disintermediation, okay? So let me uh, um, assume uh, one thing, so that um, there is, you uh, know, Andreas, right, um, among us, and I are in different continent. Assume we do not know each other, and therefore we do not trust each other very much, but uh, we have uh, negotiated a contract, and now we want to execute it. Means, you know, how do we do that? I say so. Andreas, you know, don't let the Atlantic Ocean separate us, you know, 
digitally signed, you know, we have a wit here, wit here, we have um, uh, Martin here, you know, we, we know about, you know, digital signature. Digitally signed, and I promise to digitally countersign, and now we have an executed contract. What Andreas is going to say is, Silvio, brilliant, but may I suggest even a better idea? Please do. How about you digitally sign first and send it to me, and then I promise to countersign and, and, and send it to you? Because whoever signed first is on the hook, and the other person is not yet on the hook. QED. How do we solve these problems in the real world? They're simple. We find a common trusted party. Easy for you to say. Who is it? Well, Andreas and I, we are lucky to you know, uh, both know, you know Michael Stonebreaker, whose moderate opinions and uh, um, generally mild mannerism will make us an ideal diplomat. But uh, if we are not as lucky, how the hell are we going to find such a trusted party? And, um, but assuming we do, what are we going to do? Okay, now, dear Michael, uh, you are going to receive a, a contract digitally signed by Silvio, another contract digitally signed uh, uh, by Andreas, verify Silvio's signature, verify Andreas' signature, verify bit by bit by bit that the contract is absolutely identical, and if this is the case, swap gives you know, Silvio's Andreas' signature and, uh, and Andreas' Silvio's signature, right? Two days later, because we had to explain this, and $2,000 later, because trusted parties want to be paid, we have an executed contract. Assume instead that we have this money on the ledger, as slow and cumbersome as it appears to be nowadays. So I say, Andreas, don't worry, I go first, okay? But the way I go first is as follows. I'm going to float on the network at a slightly different change of transaction. At high level, what I want to do is to, is to say the following. I, Silvio, am obliged to this contrast with Andrea. Andreas, if and only if my digital signature and Andreas digital signatures both appear in block 151. Assume the current block is 150. A few seconds later, I look up in the sky. If my signature and Andreas signature are both there, bingo, we have an executed contract. If instead mine is and not Andreas or vice versa, because everybody by definition reads the thing and sees that not both signatures are there, I'm ready to sell the house to somebody else or whatever the contract allows me to do. Time, few seconds. Cost, zero. <coughs> Nobody bets that. That is what, what the promise is. Not in this distributed database and all. It is in uh, enabling disintermediated transactions in which you and I can deal unaided by anybody leveraging the trust spread across the decentralized platform. If you don't believe in that, and you, we might as well leave now, because this talk is about enabling this type of transactions. And by the way, when there are more sophisticated things that you could do, smart contracts and things, and there are those ones who are actually saying that, you know, blockchains, there is no problem we cannot solve, including curing the common cold. This guy, very unhappy, has a cold, I sympathize, but he goes up into the chain and his health is restored. <laughs> it is a dream infrastructure. On this, there is no debate. You know where the debate comes from? How we implement them. And by the way, in implementing blockchains, you have two things to worry about. One is to implement the stamper-proof you know, business. That is easy. That is, you know, um, um, prehistoric um, um, uh, cryptography. It goes back 50 years, okay? So you take the hash of one block and you make it part of the next block. Done. Everybody does the same. 2,000 cryptocurrencies right now, they all do the same, chaining the same way. The debate is on how we choose the next block. And that's what the debate is. And I wanted to show you how Algorand chooses the next block. <coughs> And uh, Eva and Andreas yesterday informed me, says, by the way, Silvio, as you imagine, you have to give also an historical account to all blockchains that preceded you. An offer I couldn't refuse. So, I made a few slides, and uh, how do we choose the next block? Well, there are two ways, the everyone else way and the Algorand way. And uh, don't worry, I'll be brief on everyone else way, okay? <laughs> all right. So... Any cryptocurrency right now uses two basic tools. One is uh, digital signatures. You are familiar with that, you heard about it. Only I can sign, because I have a secret key. All of you can verify thanks to my biblical key. Very good. The other ingredient is really uh, an, uh, an ideal hash function. 
think of it like you know, a random oracle that takes an arbitrary long string and smashes down to 256 uh, um, 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 random string, which is an oracle. If you call x several times, you get the same answer, random x, but this is a fixed random uh, number associated to it. And uh, guess what? Therefore, it's hard to find an x and a y, which are different to each, from each other, that have the same hash. Of course, by a counting argument, there is many more x's than h of x's, so by a counting argument, there should be plenty of collisions. Good luck finding one. Okay. So, these two ingredients satisfy, in, are enough. So, how do we do the chains? So, in the example of a cryptocurrency, the transaction we care about are payments. So, a block contains a bunch of new payments which are valid relative to the history of the chain so far. And uh, also, it takes the, the hash of the previous block. And why this is, is, uh, is important? Because this prevents anybody from changing the content of the block without being caught. Assume that the blocks are so chained by this very simple rule, and assume that I come by nighttime when nobody, the sky is dark, and I change something in block number two. Because block number three contains the hash of block number two, and because, you know, you cannot find two things whose hash are the same, so the initial portion of, of the block B3 is changed, and, ver and therefore B3 is no longer the same. It has to be B3 prime. And then guess what? By induction that increases a change in the first block causes a, a change in the last block, so, if you do know the, the last block, then hop, you reject this change in the block you are, because you see that something has been messed up. That is the idea. That's how we do the chain. Isn't that simple? Now, let's look about the next block. Let me give you a few seconds over the internet. In this picture, I have only space for five players. By times a billion, you get the right, roughly the right amount. And we have a bunch of payments, okay? What, because we don't trust anybody, right, if it's a blockchain, is a decentralized, if you want to make a payment to somebody, how do you do it? You send it to 10 people, and each of them sends to another 10 people, and so in 10 hops, you cover planet Earth. And if you receive back something that you already sent before, don't do it again. So that's is the idea. But, you know, let's see this in action, ready? This payment floats all over the place generating a dust in which nobody sees anything. So let's the dust settle. And you can see that uh, focusing on just the green player and the black player, they, you see almost the same transaction that I see, right? Because in a few seconds, maybe I've seen 90% of what you have seen and vice versa, but there is a 10% that matters. And so when we want to find an agreement on a chain, it is very important to establish exactly what you see. So the point, the technical point we want to solve is the following. Whose opinion we should adopt? In Nakamoto's answer is, we use a proof of work to do this. Let me tell you what it means. Assume that in a block you also put a random quantity. You choose your random quantity, I choose my random quantity. And I hash my content with my random quantity and you hash your content with a random quantity. Because we hash, you get 256 random bits out. Look at the last k bits. You see, in the green player, the last k bits are 0, 0, 0. And, in the, and for the black player, they are not. So the green player is the winner. What does it mean? That his opinion is what counts. His block, because he is by chance lucky to find an R that is squashed by the hash function, ends in k zeros, pay attention to the green player block. That's the block we are going to put on the blockchain. Anybody else doesn't count. So once we have a winner, the winner worked very hard because, right, so if you get the k zeros in a row, and if you H is a random oracle, you should expect a 2 to the minus k probability of winning. So you try one R, you don't succeed. Try a different R, you don't succeed. Try and try and try and try and try until you get, get, get zeros in a row. And therefore, because you spend so much you know, uh, treasure in electricity and computation, you're going to get, uh, you win a few bucks. And uh, so the winner propagates his or her block, 
and everybody can verify that the block uh, really ends in uh, the right number of zeros, so you know that you are dealing with the right block. And by the way, for a proper choice OK, you are going to have one winner every 10 minutes on average, right? But say, what a second. All of a sudden, you know, I see that more people join the blockchain, more people try to solve a riddle. I see that I'm generating a block every nine minutes rather than 10 minutes. What's the big difference? Put two number zero too much and restore law and order. You want one solution every 10 minutes. Why? Because sometimes, even though you budget for a solution every 10 minutes, because you work independent than I do and everybody works on, on his own, we may be that we have two solutions a few seconds of each other, and that is a soft fork. And by the way, soft forks are an unavoidable consequence of proof of work. Okay? Which means that I saw a chain and suddenly there is a one block and a possible block, and which one is the right chain? Right? It may happen there are a few seconds of each other. So, fortunately, there is a fork resolution. Look at this blue player. He says, I want to elongate the chain. Should I put the hash of the first block in, uh, um, uh, of uh, BK1 in my next block or BK prime? I do not know. And uh, the solution is grow the longest chain. Unfortunately, the chains are equal length. Or choose at random. Oh, this I can always do in case. So, so I choose to elongate this, and I succeed in solving the riddle before anybody else. That's the, new, uh, that's the status of the system. Now comes a red player. His job is much easier. Yes, he sees a fork, but he sees a longer branch than the other. So he will elongate the longer branch. And so if you can see that temporarily this fork could continue for a while, but it's going to, uh, one takes over uh, eventually more than the other. And uh, what happens to the shortest branch? They die. You see that branch over there became one? Bye-bye. It's gone. Okay? That essentially is how proof of work operates. Now we have a rule to choose the next block. The rule has embedded some soft forks, but somehow you have a way to resolve them. That's how uh, proof of work operates, how Bitcoin, Ethereum, and uh, a lot of other things operate. Okay, and the main assumption is that the honest majority of mining power, uh, which means uh, the, uh, this com uh, these uh, computers who try to find the hash, are in the, and the majority of them are in, the honest, in, 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 in honest hands. There are some technical problems. First of all, everybody has heard that the system has a very high cost. It consumes more electricity in trying to find these ashes than the uh, country of Switzerland altogether, in fact, 20% more. And if you translate this electricity in cost, the cost of one item, in the, in, put, posting one item in the block, one transaction, is, used to be a few months ago to 20 bucks. I don't even know what it is now. Most probably is much higher. And, with, uh, and then there is also concentration of power. You know, people, uh, used to solve blocks on their uh, laptop, right? Because the number of zeros were 20 initially, some very small amount. So you have a million trials, your laptop can do it. But suddenly somebody had a great idea. You know what, I'm going to use the graphic card in my computer, which is much more powerful than the CPU, by the way. In such a case, I got more rewards. Other people imitated me. Somebody else says, you know what? I'm going to go to hardware manufacturer and uh, produce a chip who only solves this block, random and ash, random and ash, random and ash, until you get a bunch of zeros. They got more money, and guess what? People got imitated. By economy of scales, they consociate in mining pools. And right now, the uh, blockchain of, uh, of uh, Bitcoin is controlled by three mining pools. By the way, I'm coming from Shanghai, and I learned that two of them belong to the same entity. And Ethereum is controlled by two mining pools. So is a two decentralized and one is centralized? No. These things are centralized. Okay? Never mind whatever you read in the paper, the decentralized world. <laughs> That's an aspiration. We don't have anything decentralized in blockchains right now. Then scalability. Well, you know, we've, we've half and half a, a budgeting for a, one block every 10 minutes. Sorry, can't I do it every one minute? No, because remember, if I budget 
a solution every 10 minutes. Occasionally, I have a solution within a few seconds. But if I budget for a solution every minute or 30 seconds, then forks are going to be so probable that you are going to have such a spaghetti mess in which even discerning where the longest chain is is going to become impossible. So these systems are slow and allow for only a, an handful of a transaction per second, maybe two handfuls. So the world is a big place, and we want to transact with one another. That isn't the scale we need to transact. So, by the way, I understand expensive and fast. I don't understand expensive and slow. But at least the expensive and slow and decentralized, no, it's expensive and slow and centralized. I, I don't know where, where this uh, is going to go. So then there is this lack of finality. You know, soft forks means if your payment appears in a block, are you paid? No, because you may be overcome by a longer chain and you belong to a dead branch. Uh-oh, just imagine a financial world in which a wire transfer with some probability disappears. Things are going to halt. So how do you defend against this? You say, well, I consider myself paid. I'm not going to ship you the goods, not because, but I paid you. No, you're just in the, next, in the last block. I want to be two, three, four, five, six away from the last block, so to make sure that it's going to be harder, that I'm going to be overcome by a longer chain later. But you know what happens if you do this, you know, six times 10 minutes is an hour, 12 times 10 minutes is two hours, you're talking about hours rather than minutes. Not the way to pay a bill at a restaurant, otherwise you have to do a lot of small talk with the waiter before, before you settle the bill. Okay, and uh, how about security? Well, security. First of all, uh, we start seeing the first 51% um, uh, attacks, but by the way, the system was not designed to, be a t to sustain network attack. Remember, protocol is a communication protocol is run, executed on a communication network. And an adversary, why should the adversary confine himself to attack only the protocol? A true adversary is going to attack the protocol and the network, okay? And if he attacks the network, this proof of work, for a reason that I have no time to get into, is absolutely a disaster. He can really leave the system in a very sad state. You know what? I mean, proof of work and Nakamoto vision was the first idea, and it was also a great idea, okay, maybe at the time, but, but you know, we had to do better. Okay, that is what uh, we want to do. All right, what else can we do? Well, proof of work, and now we have proof of stake. But proof of stake is a menu. Which proof of stake you want? Let me examine two proof of stakes for you, right? One is called um, represented proof of stake. What is it? It's a simple idea. You say, oh, in our blockchain, these are 20 good people. They are the one in charge of producing the next block. And don't worry, they'll do this only for this month. Next month, next 20 people. Is this decentralized? No. There are some other people who say, oh, because 20 is not the right answer. 50 is the right answer. Well, 20 is centralized, 50 is centralized, if you ask me. And independently of the fact that we may be very wise and choose very trustworthy people, these 20 or 50 people that they may be, they have a big target on their chest. Shoot me, shoot me. What does it mean? That uh, if you mount a denial of service attack, which is instantaneous and very cheap, can you mount a denial of service attack, bombarding people, random messages, 50 people, even a thousand you can. And so what happens? That the buffers of these guys are full, these guys are essentially blind, and what was their job? Oh yes, to look at valid transactions not yet put in the blockchain and generating a block that contains them. These guys cannot generate blocks. Can you put the money of the world, the trust engine of the world, that anybody with a very little cost can actually shut down for, for essentially forever? No! Okay, so next, bonded proof of stake. Uh, represented proof of stake, bad, bonded good. What does bonded mean? Oh, in this bonded system, we allow to any people. We allow 200 people. We allow 2,000 people. We allow as many people are willing to do to push some money in the middle of the table where they cannot touch it, and the people who willingly put this money on the table generate a new block. And their influence in so doing is proportional to the amount of money that they put on the table. And by the way, if they misbehave, 
their money is confiscated. Wow, that should work, right? So, does it? Let me ask a simple question. How much of your disposable income can you afford to put in the middle of a table where you cannot touch it? Not invested in stock, not in bonds, hostage. And the answer is very little. So in a system like this, what's happening is that you are making it not only legal, but even easy for big thieves with deep pockets to put a, 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 a disproportionate amount of money in the middle of a table for the sole reason of controlling the blockchain. So gee, but so what? Because if they misbehave, their money is confiscated. Two answers. First, there is plenty of bad people. But there are much fewer people who are both bad and stupid. And in order for having my money confiscated, I must be pretty stupid, because I must do something so public to, to trigger the confiscation, such as I sign A and the opposite of A. Oop, I lose my money. But I can do a lot of things. If I can, for instance, uh, if I don't want to put Jennifer's transactions in the block, what can she do? Say, confiscate Silvia's money. She do not put my transaction on the block. And says, which transaction? I didn't see anything. So there is a lot of things that you can do, but it's not going to trigger any confiscation. Second answer. OK, confiscate my money. L listen, if the stuff has to be the agent of the world, the trust of the world, it should have a trillion dollar of value in assets, OK, securing a blockchain. So I can easily, by cheating, making a billion dollars. So if I lose my $10 billion, that's just the cost of doing business. It's very little. I mean, there is no way to equate the value of the blockchain with the money in the middle of the table. So these are just systems that are either openly or uh, hiddenly centralized. And we know how to do centralized stuff. I and mean, somehow we can do better than that. So let me tell you instead the different proof of stake, which is the one that Algorand uses. I call it the pure proof of stake. Let me just give you know, an English definition for now is that first of all, no punishment are needed. And you confiscate people's money? Surely we could, but we don't want to, because this gives you a false impression of security, right? To say, in our blockchain, if somebody cheats, we cut off his hands. Makes me feel good, because I have macabre instinct like everybody else, but you know, thieves have always existed. These things don't work. It's much better to design a blockchain in which cheating is impossible than to have indulged into the fantasy that I pursue the, <laughs> the cheaters exposed and try to punish them. That doesn't work. And second of all, the money is always at your fingertips, okay? And, uh, and if um, not posted in the middle of a table, not segregated, in your wallet, in your, uh, ready to be spent. And somehow, if you compute all the money in the blockchain in any shape or form, if the majority of this money is in honest hands, the system works, period. Nobody can cheat, okay? That's, that's what we want to achieve. Put it uh, differently, you know, we have uh, tokens or somehow coins or whatever you want to call them, and uh, each token is going to have uh, the same uh, power than any other token. There is not your token because, uh, is more important than mine, none of this. You take in consideration of, of them all, and everybody has the same power. And that, in some sense, is the ultimate distribution in a token system. And to achieve it is only a question of technology. It's not a question of anything else. So let me tell you how Algorand works a, a little bit you know, at a high level. It works in an effortless, one-by-one -one Byzantine agreement. Very clear. OK, let me pass it for you. So effortless and one-by-one. -one. OK, behold block one, the first block, so-called the Genesis block. OK? The Genesis block, we don't need to agree upon. Because the Genesis block is written in the description of the system. Anybody who has a blockchain, it describes <laughs> what happens in block one. It's in block two and three, et cetera, that we have to argue what are they, right? But the first block is very clear. Next to the block, you have a favor, a universal symbol of lightness and effortlessness. And as this favor gently falls to the ground, the blockchain unfolds. So, hey, that's an optimistic case. How about soft forks? This is quite linear to me. How about proof of work? Guess what? In Algorand, there are no soft forks, and there are no proof of work. So what you have is a blockchain as it was defined to be. One block at a time, one after. So it is one at a time decided. 
not one at a time, and then if there is an, it's superseded by another branch. It's one block that appears, it stays forever. Okay, how about Byzantine Agreement? Byzantine Agreement is the gift of a piece, a piece of Shostak and Lampert, which you know, is uh, maybe here uh, with us uh, today. And it's a communication protocol, very cool. That is already over 30 years uh, ago. It is a very strong notion. It is a communication protocol that if we play, say, by us, by the people in this room, satisfies two properties, agreement and consistency. And agreement means that uh, assume that each one of us starts with a value in their heads, right? We may have different values. At the end of the conversation, all honest among us agree on the same value. It is clear who is honest, who is not honest in this picture. <laughs> How about consistency? Consistency means just in case, if, big if, everybody started with the same value, then not only they should agree on a common value, but they should agree on that value, okay? Ladies and gentlemen, to satisfy agreement without consistency is easy. Here is a one-step protocol to, put, to satisfy agreement. Honest players, no matter what your value is, how to put zero? Yes, ma'am. Zero. We are in agreement. But if we started with 27, we should agree on 27, not on zero, right? So you must have both properties to, have, uh, to, for the, uh, to be meaningful. By the way, it's going to take a while to absorb this, but that is really the strongest notion of, 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 um, of reliability that there is in distributed computation. And uh, I want you to appreciate right away where we are going. What are these hypothetical values in people's head? Think of them. Remember, what is the block, next block according to me? What is the next block according to you? These are our values. At the end of the conversation, we should have a unique block because we need the chain to be visible by everybody, so we must have agreement on the block. Okay, that is the idea. But if this is the idea, there were already three decades of Byzantine agreement protocols. There is a challenge, however. These protocols are very slow. So much slow that in the typical applications, which were, where time constraints were actually very dire, I must confess, the number of players was three. The highest number I've seen was 12. And now we are going to have things on a planetary scale, right? So that is a little bit, you know, hard. Second of all, there was the assumption that we should know who the players are. Like in game theory, the, the player set is defined beforehand. It's common knowledge. So in a blockchain where people are coming all over the world, I don't know who the player are, and I don't even know the player are going to come. So it's not fixed and it's not known. So we have a lot of work to do. But we do it, and at the end, that's what we're going to do, okay? Uh, what we want to do to have a planetary agreement, a method to reach planetary agreement very, very, very fast. All right. Okay, let me summarize uh, some of the properties. It's a bunch of claims. Claims are cheap. What is the assumption? That the majority of the money is in honest hands. As mathematicians, what do we know? that the lesser the assumption, the better, if you can get uh, the same results, or better, right? So, how does this compare with uh, the majority of mining equipment is in honest hands? It compares very well, because money is fungible. With money, essentially, I can buy, if I'm an economist, anything, right? So, so therefore, if the majority of the money were in dishonest hand, nothing prevents to these dishonest people with the majority of the money to buy more money in the keeper than everybody else, and therefore you would have a majority of money in the keeper in dishonest hands, QED. So here's a lesser assumption. And what are the technical advantages? First of all, the computation is trivial. Define trivial. A few additions, a few comparison of integers, a digital signatures a verification of a digital signature. Big deal. But things that any laptop can do. You don't need to have an investment uh, capital to invest to buy special equipment. Anybody can, can participate, can do this computation. Second property, true decentralization, right? As I said, every token is the same. And actually, there is a single class of users. Which user? Us, the people who have money in the system. Unaided by miners or other exogenous parties, okay? And the uh, finality of payments. Why? Finality of transaction is very important. 
And why is achieved? Because there are no forks. Once you see a transaction is in a block, you're done. Because in Algorand, there is no forks. There are no soft forks. Actually, I'm lying. There is a small probability that there will be a fork. My probability is small. It's 10 to the minus 18. Are you familiar with this constant? I gather not, because I made it up. So let me tell you why I made it up. Because 10 to the 18 are the number of seconds that our friends, the physicists, tell us that have taken place from the big bug until now. Professor Phillips, please do not contradict me. I'll give you a gift afterwards, OK? <laughs> so in other words, if you are so good to produce a block a second, which is a pretty good clip, another way to do it is to say that, yes, there may be a soft fork in Algorand, but once in a lifetime of the universe. What a beautiful idea that when we are all humans, we all do different things, but we understand, all of us, what the age of the universe means. And this probability of forks, <laughs> I can sleep in peace, okay? All right, so then uh, um, scalability, well, you know, it is a decentralized system. By the way, nobody beats the, the, the efficiency of a centralized system. But what does it mean to be, uh, what is an optimal performance in a decentralized system? It means that we can produce a block as fast as we can propagate it. It cannot be any faster, because to decide whether the payments in a block are valid, I must know what the previous block is. But, and we can achieve this, uh, this speed. We are not, in other words, remember, a block, even in a mom and pop network, at 20 megabit per second, right? I mean, I have a... Uh, uh, 100 megabit at home, and now we have a gig, but uh, never mind. But uh, it, it takes a few seconds. So, but the 10 minutes were artificial to prevent soft forks, right? But if you don't have no soft forks, <laughs> you don't have this, uh, this constraint. How about security? And secure against a bad adversary. How bad? Very bad. <laughs> but worry not. Algorand is here to defend you, okay? <laughs> So let me tell you what does it mean bad here. Bad means that this adversary is capable of corrupting anybody who wants instantaneously, provided that he cannot corrupt more than a third of the nodes of the internet. Okay, but that is pretty hard. And, um, and, and he can actually perfectly control and organize all these you know, corrupted people. They become zombies in his hands and we do his willing, okay? The, and he can attack the protocol, and he can attack the very communication network on which the protocol is run. The only one thing he cannot do is to forge your digital signature. Which, by the way, if, if, if the scheme under, uh, is a digital scheme is secure, then not even a national state with huge uh, computational resources could do it anyway. So somehow, should we be so adversarial? You know, yes. Why? Because I'm a cryptographer? No, because I'm a realist, okay? Cryptographers are not, you know, paranoid. They are just more, more uh, very, very, very realistic. So, if you have an object like a successful blockchain with a trillion dollars in assets, bad guys like this are going to show up like mushrooms after the rain, okay? Just be prepared. <laughs> so, we must be prepared for the worst because the worst will come. Okay, so now they say okay, all these claims, uh, blah, blah, blah. how does Algorand work? Well, Algorand works in two magic phases, where the magic is actually replaced by mathematics. But even at the HLF, I find it easier to talk about magic than to talk about mathematics. So let me stick with magic. Phase one, the proposal phase. What happens? A random user, by magic, is selected among the set of all users proportionally to the amount of money he or she has. And what does the selected user do? He simply looks around for a valid transaction on the, in the blockchain, assembles in a block, and propagates the block. End of phase one. Phase two. Oops, but first of all, remember, uh, that is a very technical definition. In a proof of stake, I'm really, that every token is equal to every token. What happens here is that a random token is selected among the billions of tokens in circulation. This token has belonged to some public key, and this public key belongs to an owner. That owner proposes the block, right? And then, in, uh, and that is phase one, and in phase two, a thousand users, by magic, are selected, 
uh, again at random, proportionally to the amount of money they have, et cetera, et cetera. And what do they do? They reach Byzantine agreement on the block proposed by the first user. And why do you need the this face? Simple, because any society, and a blockchain is no exception, has these percentages of bad actors. Maybe 1%, maybe 2%. If we are unfortunate enough to live in a very dangerous society, maybe 10%, okay? 10% means that among us, <laughs> there ought to be some, uh, I don't know, 50 criminals, that's pretty scary, okay? But maybe 20%, but we'll never be in a majority. Why? Because if there are a majority, there is no society, okay? <laughs> the end, QED. So, in a society in which we come out of here and we are mugged by the police, if we go to court and the, um, and the, um, uh, the judges incarcerate routinely the innocent, a jungle is a better organized place to live. So, when you assume you, have a, you live in a very dangerous society, 10% are bad people, then one in 10 times, the, the proposer of the block can be a bad person. But what can a bad person do? First of all, he can have a very skinny block because it only puts the transaction of his or her friends. Okay? But, you know, next proposer will be good and will, put, will be more liberal and accept transaction for everybody. That's not so important. The other thing they can do, much more dangerously, a proposer can tell you a block, to me a different block, to her a, yet another block. And then putting in disagreement of what the chain is. So that's why we need the second phase in which we catch and prevent this opportunity by forcing a buzzing agreement or whatever he or she has said. Okay? That's why. And by the way, why don't we have the same problem? That's, that's an elementary probability. If you take, you know, somehow 10% of the society is bad and I take a, a thousand uh, um, people in the society at random, then uh, the probability that you know, a majority of the ones randomly selected among these thousands is uh, dishonest, that is very, very, very small. All right, so a proposal phase followed by an agreement phase. And you say, gee, Silvio, you know what, that is uh, pretty simple, but you know, I have some question lurking in my head. Some question. I hope you have hundreds of questions. The important thing is to make sure that every question has an answer, okay? I cannot, sum, I cannot do a formal proof, and I cannot go through so many questions. But I decided to go through three questions. And, uh, and um, in these three questions, we are going to do something a bit unorthodox, okay? B because the moment in which we do something uh, according to uh, traditional rules, we ended up designing, you know, Bitcoin uh, or the rest, okay? So I expect some, uh, uh, we should better start extracting some rabbits out of a hat. The first question that I get asked the most is the following. I understood that the system security is built on selecting with 1,000 people. Who selects these people? Well, what did I say? I do. <laughs> okay, so I say, that's a bad idea, right? I don't like the system. What did I say? Oh, humanity as a whole agrees on a thousand people who then agree on the block. Are you kidding me? To agree on anything is semi impossible, right? So it will never uh, finish. So in Algorand, instead, the best selection is rather counterintuitive. They Committee members, with one thousand committee member, select themselves. What? If there is a bad idea, this is one, okay? Because in fact, this is the worst idea you can have. Because if I'm bad, I select myself to approve this block, and I select myself to approve the next block, and the one after, right? Pretty. But not so fast. Because in order to be selected, it's true that you select yourself, but in the following sense, you run individually in your computer without talking to anybody, right, in a fair cryptographic lottery. So that is um, um, uh, it's so secure that uh, you cannot, even if you have zillions of uh, supercomputers, alter even minimally the probability of being selected. And if you are selected, you get a winning ticket, meaning a proof that you can show to everybody, say, pay attention to what I say because I've been selected in this committee to approve this block. And what I do, as soon as a block is proposed, I and all of you together try to see, am I selected? Very quickly I decide, if I have a winning ticket, I propagate my winning ticket and my opinion about the block, up or down it may be, simultaneously. If I'm not selected, I might as well shut up, because whatever I say is discarded. Okay? 
So let me tell you a bit about the selections. Think about if everybody for the time being has the same amount of money and there are initially a million people in the system. What do we want? A thousand people randomly selected? You set the lottery to be one in a thousand for the simple reason that a million divided a thousand is a thousand. If there are a billion people, the lottery is automatically achieves you know, a million so that a billion divided a million is still as a thousand. Okay. And by the way, you see now that it's very important that you are selected proportionally to the amount of money you, you had. Why? Because otherwise I can conduct what in the business is called a Sybil attack. Meaning, I am not Silvio. I am Silvio 1, Silvio 2, Silvio, say, Phil, Silvio million. If any one of them wins, it's all me, I win. And I'm in the committee. Instead, in, in, uh, in Algorand, what happens? If, if I have uh, one key with a million algos, or I have a million keys each with one algo, the probability of being selected is absolutely the same. So that's why this attack does not work. Okay, now let me argue that this way of doing things is both super fast and super secure. Let me start with super fast. How much does it take to do a lottery? A microsecond. And then all I have to do if I win is to propagate my winning ticket and my opinion about the block. Done, check. How about super secure? I am the big scary guy now. What is my job? To corrupt the committee. You know, I have a problem. I don't know whom I should corrupt. Right? Should I corrupt you, you, this person in the street, this other guy in Thailand? I don't know. Because the people who are going to be in the committee, you decide yourself by doing this internal lorry. I don't know who is going to have this winning ticket. However, as if you are winning, you propagate your winning ticket and your opinion about the block. Now I know who you are, and now I can corrupt you and all the other 999 people in the committee. But so what? Whatever you had to say, you already said it. And I cannot put it back in the bottle no more than the US government or any other government can put back in the bottle a message virally propagated by WikiLeaks. In other words, the system is secure because beforehand I do not know whom I should corrupt and ex post is too late to corrupt them. Okay, now we go to Byzantine agreement. Didn't you, Silvio, say that that was a very slow process? I appreciate that you scaled down from a billion to a thousand, but a thousand people to reach a Byzantine agreement is not easy. Well, with traditional protocols. That's why we designed a totally new one, which is super fast, meaning that requires only an handful of steps each of one being so easy as to consist of propagating a single, short, and easy to compute message. Can I afford an handful of such steps? Yes, proof. One, two, three, four, five. Done. Okay. And now, given that we are uh, uh, at Heidelberg in the Laureate Forum, I'd like to, to touch upon a little bit more complex doubt that may be in your mind and possibly already is there. I somehow convince you that the system is secure because I don't know whom I'm talking about. And once I know it's too late. But this reasoning is true if and only if you only say one message. But now you, Silvio, tell me that the protocol could even take even five messages. So now I don't know whom I should corrupt in this committee for the first message because I cannot put it back in the bottle. But now that I know who you are, if I can instantaneously corrupt all of you, I can control your second and third and fourth messages. And then I, this is a, gives me extraordinary power. But what is the solution in Algorand? The solution is that because convening a committee is so fast, I'm going to have a separate committee for each step of the protocol because it takes I mean, a microsecond to convene a committee. What the big deal? Okay? So I propagate a winning ticket from being part of the step X of the committee. And then I tell you what my message is in that, in that step. You know what? That is written here. A committee member speaks only once and propagates his winning proof and his step X message. Nonsense. Let me tell you that this is nonsense. What is a protocol? Never mind the technical definition. But we should agree that a protocol is an intelligent discussion satisfying some properties, like in the Byzantine agreement, agreement and consistency, right? What kind of intelligent discussions can we have that if we are the committee, 
we utter our first message, comes the adversary, machine guns all of us, and we cannot speak anymore. No problem. Another 1,000 people materialize, the adversary kills them all, they say the second thing, no problem. A third committee comes up, they say whatever to say, what kind of intelligent discussion can we have in this way? Turns out that actually there are protocols that actually that can ever satisfy their objectives in this very tough environment, in which different committees are selected independent of each other without knowing in advance who is going to be in the next committee because it's going to be determined by lottery. These are the so-called the player replaceable protocol. Let me tell you, I've been, I'm afraid to say, for de decades in the business, and I never met this definition. I didn't define, and to my, my, my point, nobody has defined, because that was a, such a bizarre property, okay? And that, the Byzantine Agreement protocol that I just said, not only is super fast, but actually has its player replaceable. And uh, because I'd like to convince you not by math, but a different setting, that there are player-replaceable protocols. And here are the example I chose to, to choose. So we have here, we have been fighting this adversary for over half an hour now, and uh, our flag uh, is in tatters, but still proudly flies. The adversary is not to giving up, in fact, he's uh, entrenched in very strong positions. And, but we our, have one goal, to carry our colors across the field and clear the field of, enemy, of the enemy. In so doing, we shall suffer heavy casualties. But you've seen the movies, I've seen them too. There is somebody who carries the flag, ah, no longer is about to die, but somebody picks up the flag on his own behalf and keeps on going, okay? And that's what we are going to do in a play replaceable protocol. So ready for action, protocol charge. Blue players, red players, green players. Victory, we won. Okay, so essentially, from the strategic perspective, it doesn't matter. <laughs> so who carries, who makes it to the finish line? The important thing is to arrive to the finish line. So we are going to have separate steps with totally separate people. So what is the relationship between these people? None, there is no relationship. So they are totally different players. And by the way, they are different numbers too, because a lottery decides you know, who shows up. So some, I budget for a thousand, sometimes I can have 1,200 players, sometimes I can have 850 players, right? And, um, and they have no shared variables, because there is no coordination. I don't know what's going to happen. And yet, in a player replaceable protocol, they act as if it was a single committee from beginning to end. This, ladies and gentlemen, is to be truly distributed. So if you see a blockchain, who is going to tell you, oh, we put to this committee, but only for two minutes. So, well, two minutes is not enough to corrupt you in the old-fashioned way. Knock, knock. Hello, you don't know me, but I'm a friend of yours. Here is a bag of money to prove it. So let's say you and I have a talk. That takes time. But to mount a denial of service attack, it takes no time. Two minutes is too long. So the, why is this instead immune to denial of service attack? Because you know not whom we should bombard with messages. And if each time there are different people, right? So that is the, that is the idea. So, and by the way, we could do even do better than that. Namely, rather than having a proposal and then an agreement phase, we can fuse the two and uh, agree on the, pro, on, on the block when the block propagates and so on and so forth. All right. So I have here maybe 10 minutes, still to the official uh, time, right? I started late. Uh, and... Uh, Yes, oh, but I will squeeze it. Um, so, you know what? The consensus protocol is enough. It's not going to say, I have a consensus protocol, therefore I have a blockchain. No, you have all kinds of things to, to worry about, in particular incentives, right? So, Nakamoto did not, in my opinion, foresaw the rise or welcome the rise of mining pools. Mining pools are a side product of an incentive scheme which was badly designed. So what we first do is to have a secure incentive scheme so that when people get money allegedly for doing what I want, they want instead to maximize their money. They don't give a damn about what I want. 
So we might make sure that when, if they maximize their money, they don't concentrate powers unwillingly in, 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 in some other form. We have to have, you know, algorithmic stabilization, picking up a few things. Why? Because everybody right now tries to solve scalability and decentralization. Good luck, they are tough problems to solve at the same time. But assume you solve them. So what if you don't have the stability of the currency? Assume that Amazon accepts euros, dollars, and algorithms, okay? Okay, I'm a button, I, have a, I own some algo, maybe I should buy it. Or maybe I should buy it 20 minutes later, if I suspect that the price is going to go in my favor. So to have somehow some stability is necessary. And I don't mean fixed to the dollar or fixed to the euro. I don't believe in this stuff. It means that I want to get rid, I don't want to fight the trend, up or down, whatever it may be, but I want to fight the daily fluctuations. And um, another thing that we should do is to minimize memory. It says, welcome to the blockchain. You want to be part of a blockchain? Excellent, welcome. Download from Adam and Eve all the blocks until now. What? That takes time, right? Very few people will join. So the trick is, is to make sure that to give the people who want to join a compact piece of information with a proof that the information is correct. The proof being linked to the first block, not to the last block. Because the only thing certain in a blockchain is the genesis block that the information is correct, then welcome, you can pick it up from here. Anybody's welcome. The second thing, we want to have a random access to the chain, because otherwise the chain is so long that if I want to figure out what happens, I should be able to do it quickly. And then we really want to have, you know, a smart concepts, etc. but let me tell you, uh, smart concepts right now are not smart enough, because you cannot do an ICO and a crypto kitten if you know this, it cannot be born at the same time. So we have to do better than that. But you know, I want to look at the self-governance. Self-governance, in my opinion, is the most important property of a blockchain. Because it's human nature to want more and more and more, right? So there is a saying in, Italy, in Italian that I think translates very well, that goes as follows. Appetite grows while eating. Are you hungry? No, what else can I want? Well. Now the food comes on the table, you say, well, I want a little bit of this and this. That's human nature. So right now, if you find another property that you never thought about and you want to incorporate in a blockchain, oh, you have two options. Start your own blockchain, 2001, say, or split the current blockchain in the classic version and the one with your property. Splitting the, the currency and splitting the community does not scale. What you want is to be able, the ability to absorb good ideas that you generate into an existing blockchain. And why, and, and, but uh, traditional blockchains are ocean liner on autopilot. They think very hard which is what is the route that should be taken. Iceberg, no iceberg, typhoon, no typhoon. It's very hard to predict. So what is good is actually to have a consensual change. And why, in some sense, Algorand works? Because remember how do we agree on a block? By proposal and agreement. Proposal and agreement. What do we agree upon? Most of the time, 99.9% .9 of the time, on the next block. But the same mechanism, the same consensus protocol can be used to agree on anything, like a new rule or a new monetary policy. Therefore, we have this evolvability that is really, in my opinion, the most imp important property of them all, because life is all about intelligent adaptation. And if you don't adapt, <laughs> we die right away. All right, so in sum, no folks, no miners, no way of confirmation, blah, 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 trivial computation, ability, and uh, all these other uh, things. And by the way, these financial tools, I really think that you know, um, it's good to aspire to a blockchain to have because it should be a goal to democratize finance. Because right now, the sophisticated financial transactions are only for the chosen few, and we can actually feed ourselves from the crumbs of their table. I think enough is enough, and I think why should any government produce bonds that only Goldman Sachs or Bank of America are able to buy, and then, then they sell it to us at a higher price? So now, so if we have the ability to directly participate, isn't this so much better? All right. 
So in conclusion, I think you know, that is, uh, is going to take you know, a lot of challenge and everybody should be congratulated. And I believe that maybe if not 2,000 blockchains, a few of them survive. But remember one thing, it's going to be really technology that is going to um, win this game uh, at this point in time. And so I'd like to leave you with an image uh, of the Julian Bridge. The Julia Bridge in southern France, right, was built, I believe, uh, three before Christ. So it's uh, 2,021 years of uh, in, uninterrupted operation. And guess what? During medieval times, for at least a thousand years, it was not repaired at all. And until 2005, they carried the cars and trucks to go across, okay? Right now, they changed their policy. Only pedestrians can do. But it, this bridge was a marvelous of traditional physical architecture and enable, in fact, to people to transact and meet each other across the different sides of a river. And I believe that a blockchain properly constructed is going to be as beautiful and as useful to bridge as humanity is together as any physical infrastructure that we have erected. So let's build it together and let's build it right. Because if we build it together and right, we are going to sustain the planet for many centuries to come. The job of which was Mr. Atlas, as everybody knows. But, you know, after a few thousand years, he looked a little bit tired. So let's thank him for his job and let's take it from here. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you very much for your most inspiring and magical talk and for po pointing out the magical solutions are mathematical solutions.